The other day I read a story about two frogs that fell into a can of cream. And uh, as they fell into the can of cream, one said to the other, Oh no, I think I'm going to drown. So he gave up and he drowned. The other one decided, Well, I may drown, but I'm not going to give up that easy. So he kept on swimming and he kept on swimming and he kept on paddling. And before long, the cream turned to butter and he jumped out of the can. That frog was able to get out of there because he kept on going. He didn't give up. I read a story about a preacher years ago by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. He visited with President Hoover years ago. And he was encouraged by Hoover's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this preacher said, Mr. President, what would you say is the secret uh, to your success in life? And quickly the president answered, With the help of God, I never gave up. With the help of God, I never gave up. Well, we all know of people who have given up, people who have turned aside, People who have departed from their commitment to Jesus Christ and His service. Perhaps even somebody is here this morning and you're going through a tough time. The pressure is on in your life. The temptations to sin is real in your life. The attacks of liberal thinking against Christianity is overwhelming you and you're maybe thinking about giving up, departing from the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to encourage you this morning to stand firm and keep on standing firm in your faith. Let's turn together to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and let's look at verses 1 through 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and we'll look at verses 1 through 13. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, feel free to follow along on the screen. I'm preaching a message on this subject this morning, standing firm in the faith. Standing firm in the faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica these words, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we are comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His 
saints. Our Father and our God, now once again we bow before you with a humble heart. God, we ask you to cleanse us of any wicked thought, any wicked way, and give us clean hands and a pure heart. God, I pray that you'd preach through me and in me what thus saith the Lord. Speak to your people today. God, open the hearts of your people that they may receive the word. God, if there be one here this morning that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that you would open their heart and that they would trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, to be their Savior and Lord. Lord, to that one that's discouraged today in the Christian life, may this be the very message that would encourage them, build them up, and support them in their faith and help them carry on in the journey of the Christian life. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Apostle Paul is writing to these young believers at Thessalonica. It's clear that he desires to see them. It's clear that he desires to be with them. And it's clear that he desires for them to be grounded in Christ. He desires for them to be standing firm in Christ. He desires for them to be living for Christ openly in this world. And he desires for them to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's apparent in this chapter that the Apostle Paul was worried about these believers. He was worried that their faith maybe has been shaken. He's worried that maybe the tempter has come and blown them off course. He's worried that his efforts of sharing the gospel with them and starting a church there uh, maybe has come to no effect from the tempter's work in their life. He, so he sends Timothy to them. He can't, can't go to them, so he sends Timothy. And Timothy goes and ministers to them. And after some time, Timothy returns to the Apostle Paul and he rejoices at the good word, at the good report, especially in the fact that they were standing fast in the Lord. Notice that phrase there in verse number 8. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. In other words, Paul says, I'm able to carry on. I'm able to go a little bit further. I'm able to rejoice in life since I know you are standing fast in the Lord. Now the idea to stand fast in the Lord means to stand firm. It means to hold one's ground. It means to maintain your position. It means to continue in a certain path, in a certain state without diverting to the right or left or going backwards. To stand fast means to keep on. It means to persevere and to endure. And specifically here he's saying stand fast, stand firm, hold your ground, continue in this same state, maintain your position, and that position is in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's talking about their relationship with Christ, uh, their position in Christ, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He desires for them to be firmly committed to Jesus Christ in belief. Firmly committed to Jesus Christ in faith. Firmly committed to Jesus Christ in service. Firmly committed to Jesus Christ in obeying and following Him. Paul is rejoicing in that. You know, when I think about the Christian life, and people falling by the wayside and people diverting to the right or the left, people losing ground, people backsliding, people turning their backs on their faith. Folks, I believe that as we live in this world and we have trouble in this world, the pressure to live the Christian life until Jesus comes will get that much harder for Christians. So it's important as pressure comes, as the winds of trouble blow in our life, it's important that we stand firm, that we hold our ground, that we maintain our position in the Christian life. I want to share with you this morning a couple of insights from this text about standing firm. And I pray that these insights 
will help each and every single one of you maintain your position and relationship with Jesus Christ. Number one, God has sent people into our lives to help us stand firm in the Lord. God has sent people into our lives to help us maintain our position of standing firm in the Lord and in the faith. Look with me at verse number 1. Paul says, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it. Now, what is he talking about? If you look back in verses 17 through 20 of the last chapter, you'll find that Paul wanted to go be with them. Paul made every effort, but Satan hindered him time and time again, so he has to remain in Athens. But since he has to remain in Athens and he can't go be with them, he sends his fellow servant, he sends his brother, he sends Timothy to go help them. You know, in another passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul speaks of Timothy in such a way and says, There's no other man that's like-minded as, with me as much as Timothy. Timothy was the next best to having the Apostle Paul. Timothy was the very disciple of the Apostle Paul. Timothy was that one that Paul was mentoring and Paul had mentored him and prepared him to do the work of the ministry and now Timothy is stepping up to the plate and going to minister to these believers in Thessalonica. Paul says, I'm sending Timothy to you in verse number 2 to establish you. Notice that phrase there, to establish you. The phrase establish you means to strengthen. It means to cause someone to become stronger. It means to shore up. It means to buttress something. Uh, The best illustration of that I think that you could understand would be, I remember when I was a small kid and I was uh, spending the weekend one time with my Paul Monday. And he was uh, putting up some new fence posts and putting up some new gates for his horses. And when he dug the hole in the ground to put the post in there, he didn't just put the post as it was, but he put concrete in there with the post to hold the post in place. He was making sure to establish it where it wouldn't move, where it could take force, where it could take pressure, where it could be shaken and not moved. Paul is saying, I'm sending Timothy to you to help you. He's going to instruct. Encourage you. He's going to strengthen you in the faith. He's going to make you strong. He's going to take the Word of God. He's going to take the truths that I've committed to Him. He's going to impart them unto you. The same truths that made Him strong in the faith, He's going to share with you to make you strong in the faith as well. And then Paul says, not only is Timothy coming to establish you, he's coming to encourage you concerning your faith. Now, Paul has already mentioned that these people have suffered. In chapter number 2, the verse 14, Paul says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. They are suffering persecution for their faith in the Lord. They're a little bit down. They're a little bit low. And Paul says, I'm sending Timothy along to help you stand firm. He's not only going to strengthen you in your faith, he's going to give you some tools from the Word of God to make you strong, but he's going to come alongside you and encourage you and pick you up as well. He's going to give you a boost along the way. You know, the church is like a family. The Bible refers to the church as a body and the church as a building and the church as an army, but the church is also referred to as a family. God Almighty being the heavenly Father. But in the church family, and I love the illustration there in 1 John. 1 John talks about in the family of God, you've got those who are mature in the faith. 
Uh, that would speak of those who, who are well-seasoned, they're well-matured in the faith. That would be the grandparents in a church, the spiritual grandparents. Then in a church family, you have those who are mature in the faith. Uh, they are growing in the Lord. They're getting strong. They would be the parents, the spiritual parents in the church. And then in the body of Christ, you also have uh, the spiritual teenagers and, and uh, children in the body of Christ who they're believers, they're beginning to grow in their faith, but they're still really young. There's still a lot of room for growth. There still uh, needs encouragement and, and to be established in the faith. And then you have the newborn babes, the spiritual newborn babes in a church family. And it's important in the church family for you to recognize your position where you are, whether you're a spiritual grandparent, a spiritual parent, a spiritual teenager, a spiritual child, or a spiritual babe in Christ. It's important for you to know where you are, your position, so that you can have a part in either giving help to somebody to establish them in the faith or receive help from somebody so that you can be established in the faith. You see, we who have been nurtured in the faith, you and I who have been helped, you and I who have been discipled in our walk with Jesus Christ, we're not to just stop with ourselves. No, we're to take that another step further. We're to make another move. We're to keep on pressing in our walk with the Lord. And the way we do that is to find a younger believer in the faith, somebody less mature in the faith, take them under our wing just as Paul did Timothy and Timothy was doing the believers at Thessalonica so that they can be established in the faith just as you were. And then not only are we to look for somebody to nurture in the faith, we're also to accept that kind of help. You know, I heard it said one time, everybody needs a Paul and, and everybody needs a Timothy. You need somebody in your life that can encourage you and help you to mature in the faith. But you also need to find somebody that you can help mature in the faith. So you've got to not only be willing to give, you've got to humble yourself to receive help, to link yourself up to another believer, to come under the leadership and the help and the guidance and the wisdom of another Christian who's seasoned in their walk with the Lord. I'm so thankful that God has sent people into my life to help me stand firm in the faith. I think about people in my family. I think about uh, mentors that the Lord has sent along the way. I'm thankful during those times when I've had questions, when I've had doubts, those times when my faith has been shaken, that there was some godly people that's come along when the winds was blowing me from side to side and they came up and established me and held me still in the faith. So folks... Remember, when trouble comes, we need some godly people in our lives to help us stand firm in the faith. Number two, troubles come as a test to determine whether or not you are standing firm in the faith. Now, if you look at the text right here, beginning at verse number three, Paul says that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain." 
Now Paul makes it very clear to these people that in the Christian life trouble is going to come. Trials are going to come. The winds of persecution, the winds of heartache, the winds of trouble, the winds of this life and of Satan to tear you down is going to come into your life. It's going to blow you. It's going to shake you up and it's going to shake you all around at times. Paul goes on to say, in addition to that, that we were appointed to this. Sometimes we think when we're going through a trial or we're going through a troublesome time in our life, we want to blame Satan for all of it. And maybe Satan may be at work, but I want to tell you, if you're a child of God, nothing comes into your life that it doesn't first go through the hands of your loving Heavenly Father. You see, in the Christian life, nothing is coincidental and nothing is accidental and nothing is incidental. Everything is providential. God Almighty is working in my life and God Almighty is working into your life and He's not going to let anything come into your life that He doesn't first approve of. And He approves of it for a purpose and He proves of it for a reason. You see, it's all a part of God's divine plan. In Philippians chapter 1, verse number 29, the Apostle Paul says this, For to you it has been granted on the behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Sometimes there are preachers, and especially on television, that promote the prosperity gospel. They promote a gospel, a Christian message that says if you trust Christ as your Savior, everything is going to be okay. But that goes directly against the Word of God. Yes, eternally speaking, everything will be okay. Yes, spiritually speaking, everything will be okay. But I want to tell you something. If you trust the Lord Jesus Christ and you desire to live godly in this world, the Bible says you will suffer persecution and you will have trouble. It's going to come. Paul says it's a part of the Christian life. Not only is it a part of the Christian life, over in Philippians chapter number 3, the Apostle Paul explains how that as we are going through sufferings as a believer, we are participating, we are sharing in the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're identifying with Him. We're taking part in the sufferings that He went through. We are being made one with him. And then if you look over in Second Corinthians chapter number 12, you remember how Paul had that thorn in the flesh and he prayed for God to take it away from him three times. And God said, I'm not going to take it away from you, but I'm going to give you grace. And my grace is going to help you get through that trial. And in the midst of that wonderful truth from Almighty God, the Apostle Paul discovered that at the moment when he's the weakest, at the time when he's suffering the most, at the time when he's going through the most trouble, that's when he's able to experience the power of God the most working in his life. When you're going through a trouble, when you're going through a trial, you may think that you're all alone and that God's left you, but that may be when God's working the most in your life. We see here it's in troubles that we learn to trust in Jesus. As the song says, we learn to trust in God and we learn to depend upon His holy word. And then troubles come into our life by the tempter. Paul here describes Satan as the tempter, the one who would lure us away, the one who would deceive us, the one who would pull the wool over our eyes, the one who would trick us just like he did Adam and Eve in the garden. Verse number 5, he refers to him as the tempter. You see, when trials come into our life, Satan tries to bring the worst out of us, but God is trying to reveal the best in us. When trials come in our life, Satan tries to destroy us, but God's trying to develop us. When trials come into our life, it's to prove whether or not we're firmly planted on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I love that parable over in Matthew chapter number 7, verses 24 through 27. You remember Jesus talked about a wise man and a foolish man. He said, the wise man, what, built his house on the rock. The foolish man, though, he built his house on the shifting, sinking sand. The wind came, the rain came, the floods came, and the storms came. The house on the sand, it fell, and great was the fall of it. But the house that was founded on the rock, it stood firm. Oh, yeah, there may have been some shingles missing and There may have been some windows busted and there may have been some damage to that house, but the house was still there and the house was still intact and the house was still livable because it was on a firm foundation. And that's like the child of God. When you go through troubles in this life, it reveals whether or not that you're firmly planted on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do some fall to the wayside? Why do some turn away from the faith? It's because they have never truly committed their heart to to Jesus Christ. Their commitment was a superficial commitment. Their commitment was only in the moment a commitment. Their commitment was only half-hearted. But you see, the one who fully commits his heart to Jesus Christ, the Bible says, I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Troubles come as a test to determine whether or not you're standing firm in your faith. Then thirdly, I notice from this text another insight, and that is other believers will be encouraged as they see you standing firm in the faith. Now look with me at verses 6 through 8 of our text. The Bible here tells us about Timothy coming back to Paul. And Paul says, Timothy brought us good news of your faith and love. The word, the term good news right there uh, refers to the fact that the news was so good it was almost as good as the gospel. Good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us. And Paul goes on to say, Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we are comforted concerning you by your faith. Paul's saying, I was a little bit down. I was a little bit weak. I was a little bit discouraged. You know, I wanted to come and minister to you, and I was worried about you. And, and, and uh, you know, life has been hard uh, for Paul as well. But when Paul received this message that the believers of Thessalonica were standing fast in the Lord, they were standing firm, they were maintaining their position, they were continuing in the place that the Lord Jesus Christ had grounded and planted them, it uplifted him and it encouraged him. It uplifted him. You know, I want to tell you something, folks. Somebody's watching your life and somebody's watching my life. The Bible says no man lives or dies unto his own self. And you see, no matter how young in the faith you are, how old in the faith you may be, somebody is watching you. Have you ever noticed that when a tree falls, a great big tree that falls, it takes other trees down with it at the same time? When a tree stands Firm. When a tall tree stands firm, then, then, uh, then the other trees are not harmed in that storm because the big tree is standing tall. But if the big tree falls, it'll take the little trees down with it at the same time. You see, in the Christian walk of life, We've got other believers that's went on before us and they've run the race and they've been faithful to God. Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 speaks of that. They stand as an example. They stand as an encouragement for us to keep carrying on. But also, it's like uh, fresh water, cool water from a far country when you hear of another believer that's going through a tough time, yet they're standing strong in their faith in Jesus Christ. Some of you share with me from time to time those articles from the voice of the martyrs and where people are being persecuted around the world, the persecuted believers. And it amazes me to hear the stories of them standing firm in their faith, some of them losing their family and their jobs and their homes and being tortured for their faith. Yet they're standing firm 
And what an encouragement that is to you and to me. Others will see your life and be encouraged when they see you standing firm. And then finally, I see another insight from this text. And that is continuing to develop spiritually will help you to continue standing firm in the faith. Now catch what I'm saying. Continuing to personally develop spiritually will help you to continue standing firm in the faith. Now look with me at verse 10 through 13. These people were strong. These people were standing fast in the Lord. These people were maturing and holding their ground. But we see that Paul still was thinking about them. He was praying for them. And he wanted to help them by adding any piece that was missing from their faith. Look at verse 10. He says, Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your life. Now the word perfect there means to adjust. It means to equip It means to fit together. It means to furnish as a fisherman men's nets. That's the idea there. So it can catch more fish and they don't go out through the holes. As a doctor sets a bone back into place. Or as a military officer makes preparations with his army. That's the idea to perfect, to equip, to furnish, to put in place anything that is lacking in your faith. In other words, Paul is saying you're maturing in the Lord. You're standing firm in the Lord. But don't get the idea that you've arrived. Don't get the idea that you've reached a plateau where you don't have to grow anymore. Don't get the idea that you've reached a point in your life where you've matured all that you're going to mature. I'm praying that the Lord will continue to mature you and I'm hoping to come to you, Paul is saying, so that I can help you mature anymore. Any area in your life spiritually that needs improving, I want to help you do that. And then Paul wanted their love to increase and abound. Look at verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. Uh, You see, times of suffering can sometimes make people bitter. You ever heard the old saying, the water that hardens the egg also softens the potato. Y'all know what I'm talking about. How many of you ladies, when you make tater salad, you boil your eggs and your taters together? Maybe we're the only ones that does that, Misty. But anyway, the same water that hardens the egg is the same hot water that softens the potato. For some people, trials and troubles in their life, instead of becoming a stepping stone, They become a stumbling block. Sometimes trials can cause you to get self-centered. Sometimes trials can cause you to close in and quit looking outward. Paul is saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Even if you're going through a trial, I want you to continue developing in your love. I want you to continue increasing in your love, abounding in your love. Just as a river overflows its banks, I want your love for each other to to not only be sensed in your heart, but to be expressed to one another. And not only to believers, but to everybody, even to lost people. You know, sometimes when people say, we have a loving church, they mean the members love each other. But not only should a loving church love each other, but a loving church ought to love lost people and ought to love people on the outside and ought to love people that have not been a part of us before. A love increasing for all. Suffering can teach us to love. You remember Joseph? He suffered for 13 years. What caused all of the suffering? What was the domino that initiated one problem after another? You say, well, he was boastful. He was prideful in his family. Yes, he was. But it all started going downhill for him when his brothers threw him in a pit and then sold him into slavery. One year of suffering after another, 13 long 
years. But you know what? Joseph eventually became the prime minister of Egypt. He became the man who carried that whole civilization through a famine. He showed them how to save and how to prepare and how to get ready. And you know what? One day he was administrating and some people showed up and he got to looking and realized, this is my brother's. He hadn't seen them in a long time. Now what does Joseph do? Does he get even? Does he think, here's my chance? No. He helps them and he eventually reveals himself to them and he loves them. And he gives them a place to live and takes care of them. You see, even during times of suffering, we want to say, God, use this suffering that I'm going through to make me a better Christian. And then we see Paul wanted their hearts to be established, blameless in holiness. Verse number 13 says, So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now just because you've been standing firm in the faith doesn't mean that there's no room for improvement. Sometimes... The stakes of our tent, when the winds start blowing, need to be driven down just a little bit further. Need an extra lick so that it's able to remain steady through the storm. I want to ask you, are you standing firm this morning? Are you standing firm? Has the winds of this life, the winds of temptation, the winds of sin, the winds of the devil's lies? Have they been blowing you around? The winds of disappointment? Have you been troubled here lately? Has the pressure been on? Have you been tempted to depart from the faith? Have you been tempted to turn aside? If you've been struggling here lately, I want to invite you to come during this invitation and then we're going to pray over you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to uplift you. Would there be one here today as we stand to our feet that would be willing to come and say, Hey, I've been under a lot here lately and I need my church family to encourage me, to help me stand firm. Would you come this morning? Let me pray with you. Would you come? Would you come? Would there be one here today and you're not grounded in Jesus Christ? I want to invite you to come and give your heart to Jesus today. Whatever the need of your heart may be, whatever God's speaking to you about, whatever I can help you with, I want to invite you to come. Dear